Good morning, everyone, and a special welcome to our expanded audience through coverage by C-SPAN. I'm Kent Lastman at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. For the next hour, I'll be your host for a conversation on how science is used in the development of regulatory policy. As you know, scientific knowledge is not fixed. Crucial to the emergence of new, useful information is the scientific process that demands review, replication, and validation of both what we know and how we came to know it. Today's program is part of a series. Since last April, CEI has hosted more than two dozen events with leading lawmakers, regulators, academics, and authors. All of this programming is available at our website, www.cei.org, and on our YouTube page. And like each of our past programs, I want to include you in the conversation. So if you have a question for me or one of our speakers, please use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen or send me an email at events at cei.org. For members of the media, I'll do my best to prioritize your questions and read them in their entirety. I ask only that you include your name and the outlet in the question. For all other questions, they will be presented only with your first name. And as a reminder to everyone, today's program is being recorded and will be rebroadcast. Now I'm really excited for today's guests. We have Myron Ebel and Andrew Wheeler. Myron of, is, of course, my colleague here at CEI where he leads our Center for Energy and Environment. And he has been intimately involved with policy development on Capitol Hill and in the executive branch, a special insight into how the Environmental Protection Agency operates. But perhaps no one better understands today's EPA policy process than the administrator, Andrew Wheeler. Rather than spend time, precious time, on a recitation of his biography, I'd like to get right to the heart of things. Mr. Wheeler has worked closely with the public to develop significant reforms to EPA policy. And I'm looking forward to hearing from him today about a new rule to advance transparency and improve the quality of information used at the EPA. Administrator Wheeler, welcome to CEI. Please tell Thanks. us what have you been working on and what problem does this new regulation address? Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Myron. And it's, it's great to be with you today. And I appreciate you hosting today's program. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us as well. And today I am proud to announce the signing of our new rule, strengthening transparency in pivotal science. The rule deals with issues concerning transparency and the integrity of EPA's use of science that are at the core of the agency's reputation. The scientific method operates in a circuit from hypothesis to experiment to observation and then back to experiment to retest itself. That method is the foundation for agency science. Both science and transparency have been at the center of the EPA since its founding in 1970. A lot has changed since the 1970s. The science and our regulations have gotten more complex. In the 1970s, for any given topic, the agency may have had a few dozen studies in order to guide their decisions. Today, we have hundreds, if not thousands of studies to help guide individual decisions. And the American public is more in tune with the various scientific questions today than they were then. The American public deserves to know which studies we are using to craft our regulations and which of those studies are key or pivotal to our decisions. And to the extent possible, that data should be available for the public to see. For a number of reasons, our regulatory decisions have gotten more contentious over the decades. And I believe if we explain the rationale behind our decisions, including the science that we use to make them, then they will be better accepted by the public. The American people want to be more involved and they want to understand and they deserve that opportunity. The American people want to, their, the American people's trust in government and their trust in the media is at an all time low. And who can blame them when they see politicians arguing over scientific facts and environmental activists masquerading as environmental reporters? Who are they to believe? That's one reason why we have seen an increase in citizen science. 
When I started at EPA in 1991, I worked on the community right to know law, and I fundamentally believe that the American public has a right to know about our regulations and their scientific underpinnings. Back in the 1980s, Administrator William Ruckelshaus wrote an historic memorandum called the Fishbowl Memo, in which he demanded that EPA employees act in the open and ensure that the basis of the agency's decisions appear in the record. This public position has been carried forward and echoed by each one of my predecessors, Republican and Democrat, because transparency knows no political ideology. This rule was initially proposed back in 2018, and in March of last year, EPA announced a supplemental rulemaking, taking public comment on it twice. There was controversy then, and there is controversy now over the rule, much of it is the result of misreporting in the press. So I will go over what is actually in the rule. This rule establishes how EPA considers the use of dose response data that underpins pivotal science used in significant regulatory actions and influential scientific information. By dose response, I mean the data used to characterize the quantitative relationship between the amount of dose or exposure to a pollutant or contaminant and the effect of that dose or exposure on people or the environment. This rule will apply only to future significant regulatory actions or influential scientific information and has no retrospective effect on agency actions. It protects personal information and confidential business information and does not require the release of either, despite misrepresentations in the press as late as this morning. The rule does not categorically exclude or prohibit the use of any study, but rather requires EPA give greater consideration or weighting to studies where the underlying dose response data are available in a manner sufficient for independent validation. This can include data that are publicly available or very importantly, or available through restricted access. That also has not been reported in the press. The rule ensures that all pivotal science go through independent peer review that is consistent with guidance from the Office of Management and Budget. And finally, the rule requires the agency clearly identify and make publicly available the science informing a significant regulatory action. This rule applies only to EPA and its internal procedures. It does not direct the actions of any third party. Nearly all of the criticisms of the rule are essentially the same, that the new rule will somehow weaken the science informing EPA's actions. This claim is a strange one, and one that is being repeated by people who have clearly not read the rule for themselves. I recommend that people read the rule before allowing the interpretation of others to be your own. EPA can secure independent validation of results and still protect confidential and personal information. What this new rule will do undoubtedly is provide the transparency needed to allow the public the opportunity to check our work. Transparency is a defense of, not an attack on the important work done by our career scientists here at EPA, along with their colleagues, the research institutions around the country. To restrict scientific inquiry would violate everything this agency has done over the past 50 years to improve human health and the environment. We believe this new rule will support the best science and strengthen the legal defense of our rulemakings. Opponents of this rule have made unsubstantiated claims against it and mis misrepresented its effect, which makes me wonder what their motive is. I believe a number of the critics are very cynically trying to kill this effort because they prefer the agency to make decisions in proverbial smoke-filled back room where they don't have to explain how the agency reached a particular decision on a pesticide or chemical. I look at the environmental justice communities in particular in Louisiana or Texas or West Virginia where the right to know law told them how much of a chemical was being released in their neighborhoods. This rule tells them what science we use to regulate those chemicals. 
This week, Congress is considering legislation to require more transparency in executive branch budget requests. Those members believe that more transparency on the budget will help Congress and the American public. Those same members should support more transparency for EPA science and regulations. Why would anyone want our decisions to be made in secret? In the past, increased transparency strengthened EPA's credibility among the public. I continue to pursue that legacy today. Because this agency protects human health and the environment of all Americans, regardless of their zip code, we are all stakeholders in the work of the EPA. I want to thank you again for your time and thank you for hosting us today. I look forward to taking some questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, because I know we have questions for you. They've started uh, coming right in. M Myron, let me get you into this conversation. Um, the, the rule about transparency, one, one might say it's been 50 years in the making. Uh, Mr. Ruckelhaus was referenced, the, the establishment of the EPA. Uh, but at least in its form, as we saw today, going to the Federal Register, the rule changed significantly from the draft rule over the past three years. What have you seen, uh, what are the developments with the rule as it is now written that uh, we'll be living with? How, how has it changed? Uh, thank you. Uh Kent, uh, and thank you, uh, Administrator Wheeler. I'm going to call you Andrew from here on out so I don't get tongue tied with Administrator. Um, th this rule uh, was originally proposed um, in a way that uh, created a huge amount of controversy and negative reaction. And I think, um, to EPA's credit and to Andrew's credit, uh, they went back to the drawing board. The new rule is, uh, has broadened the application but narrowed uh, what it does. And I think uh, for people who are looking for a magic bullet to solve the crisis of scientific uh, integrity and, and, uh, the, irre and, uh, and the irre irreproducibility crisis, for those people, this rule it may be a disappointment, but I think what we need to understand is it's, it's an incremental step forward that takes a piece of this wider crisis in scientific integrity. Uh, and I think the problem with science is that, uh, if I may borrow a term from a, a media outlet, scientific uh, innovation and integrity dies in darkness. And uh, this rule, I think, not only uh, solves a piece of the problem in the interaction between science and regulations, but it also, uh, contributes to the wider uh, conversation that we need to have about what to do about the, the, uh, the, the junk science, uh, the secret junk science problem that is uh, plaguing our society and that really not only corrupts politics, cor corrupts the regulatory process and the legislative process, but it also corrupts science. So I think this, this rule is, is a, a real contribution uh, to the wider uh, debate and, and solving the problem. And uh, we can talk perhaps later about what, what else needs to be done, but I think this is a, is a really great step forward. And I'm, I'm glad that they've, I think, fixed some of the, uh, the identified problems in the rule. Let's see if we can get uh, right into the questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Wheeler, I saw you leaning forward, so I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, but maybe you could wrap it into your answer to the first uh, question we have from a reporter. This is from Marianne Lavelle at Inside Climate News. Uh, and she hones in on something that, that I made a note of uh, during your remarks about the nature of the rule being forward-looking and having no retrospective effect. She asks, although Administrator Wheeler says the rule does not have retrospective effect, the EPA is continually reassessing the science on particulate matter. How will it affect future scientific assessments on PM and air quality standards? And secondly, will the early studies that relied on confidential health data be excised from those assessments? Now, this is really at, at the heart of some of the controversy of the early uh, feedback to the draft rule. Uh, how, how do you address that? 
Sure, um, and, and that's a great question, and I, and I appreciate that. And there, there is no scientific study um, based on this rulemaking that will be um, absolutely ruled out from use by the agency. Um, the older studies can very well still um, still be used and probably will be used. Um, let's take, for example, and because I know there's been questions and there's been, been misreporting in the press on the six city study from you know the, the old six city study from the 19 um, let's say 1980s. Um, that's that was a pivotal scientific study for, for in particular for PM science. Um, if that is a pivotal, if that is identified in future rulemaking as one of the pivotal studies used for a future rulemaking, for example, we just finished the, the next review. I'm not sure that the six city study was one of the pivotal studies used in that review because we use uh, more recent studies to uh, make the decision on the PM this, this year. But if, for example, if, if the agency wanted to use that in the next five year review, they take a look at that, they take a look at whether or not the data is available to the public. They also take a look at whether or not it's available in a restrictive fashion. The six city study was reviewed by the Health Effects Institute, HEI, about 20 years ago. Um, I actually played a key role in, in making sure that they reviewed that and they reviewed it. They had restricted access to that information. So I, I can't prejudge any particular study, but you know it's very easy for that one to, to qualify to continue to be used because that information was available in restricted fashion to an independent um, peer review. You know, a lot of people think that peer review means that the peer reviewers actually look at the underlying data, and that's not um, usually the case. In fact, at this day and age, most independent reviewers do not look at the underlying data when they peer review a study. We want to make sure that that data is available either to the public or is available in a restricted fashion. And when you're dealing with um, personal health information, um, it, it's probably very um, likely that that will have to be made available in a restricted fashion. But say um, the six city study, it could pass uh, could pass muster under the fact that it was reviewed by an independent party with restricted access. Even if that hadn't occurred, under under the regulation, the administrator of the EPA can still deem a study important and necessary for a scientific review for regulation. Um, if it's a pivotal study, if it's it's really important to the agency for that rulemaking. So there is, a, there is an ex exemption where the administrator can still step in even if that data was not available publicly or not available in a restrictive fashion. The administrator can still say, this is still a pivotal study that has to be used for a decision. So there is no study um, that will automatically be cut out from review by the agency going forward. Our goal in this is to make as many of these, um, the pivotal studies that we use for a regulatory decision make that information available to the public. Another aspect of this is very important is for the agency to identify what are the pivotal studies. When we look at the PM, um, when we look at the, the PM review for under the NACs, we're looking at hundreds if not thousands of studies. Now, most people can maybe figure out which ones we consider pivotal based upon the staff report, but we will be requiring that the agency actually identify which of the studies that they're looking at, identify them as pivotal. And I think that's very important. That alone is a, is a huge um, step forward in transparency for our regulations, for us to actually identify what are the pivotal studies, what are the important studies out of the hundreds or thousands of studies that we use for regulatory decision, what are those studies that are really at the heart of our regulatory decision? And I think that alone, even if the data is not available, is an important step forward for transparency. It, it sounds to me, um... Uh, as if you're, you're positing uh, this agency under my leadership and any future leadership, we have confidence in our work. We're willing to show our work to demonstrate these are the studies that we're relying on and this is how we came to our conclusions. Is that a fair representation for the, uh, for the public to, to understand the rule? A absolutely. I've been privileged to serve as the 15th administrator of this agency. We've only had 15 administrators in our 50 year history. And on all of the decisional meetings that I've had for regulations, I've had our career scientists briefing me and I, I um, fully agree, um, support and agree with the, the briefings that I've received and the recommendations that I've received from the EPA staff. But that information that an administrator of the EPA, that information is not routinely available to the public. The public doesn't know 
what the administrator um, looks at as far as recommendations from the staff, as far as what studies are important. And I think that should be made public, which is the heart of what we're trying to do here. Try to take the decision-making out of the proverbial back room, um, sun, shine some light on it and tell the public, this is the basis for our regulation. This is why the administrator is making a decision on whether or not to regulate and to what level to regulate. And I believe that if we explain that to the American public, there will be better acceptance of our scientific decision. Right now, we just we appear as though um, some oracle on high saying this is how it's going to be and this is what the regulation or this is what the standard is going to be. And we don't explain to the American public how we made that decision. And that is all I'm trying to do with the science transparency and what we did with the cost benefit transparency um, a few weeks ago. Wanting to make all this information available to the public and shine light on it. Now, I've seen criticism. Uh, for example, Senator Carper has said, uh, prior to the rule coming out in this period between a draft and what, what came available today, that the EPA is trying to limit the use of scientific data. And, th and that leads me to a question we have from Nick, uh, who asks, is this subject to the Congressional Review Act? Uh, if, you've, if you've received these congressional criticisms prior to the rule being made public, do you expect and is it subject to the CRA? Thank you for that question. First of all, um, you're right. Senator Carper put out a statement last week. Um, he and his staff had not read the final regulation. I think it'd be great if our critics actually read what we do before they criticize us. Um, this knee-jerk reaction to anything and everything that we do is, is just not helpful in the public discourse. Um, but as far as your, the second question on whether or not the Congressional Review Act is applicable, it is not. This is an internal housekeeping regulation. It does not affect external um, people to the agency. And so um, as the, defined by the Congressional Review Act, it is, the Congressional Review Act is not applicable. Um, it's also not a major regulation as far as the cost is concerned. So um, for under both, under both prongs, um, this would not uh, be subject to the Congressional Review Act. That would suggest it's more of a um, management decision, right? For you and future administrators, how you want to run an honest agency that, that reports to the public in the best way possible. Um, have you had conversations with uh, transition teams or other folks about uh, maintaining and implementing this rule going forward? Uh, no, to my knowledge, we haven't had any questions from the transition team about this. Um, We've made available to the transition team um, literally thousands of pages of binders on, on, on different topics that um, we've been putting together over the last year. And then um, after the, the, the Biden transition team was certified by um, GSA, I believe, um, they've requested a number of briefings and I think we've conducted over 50 different briefings for them. Um, but I don't believe this has been one of those um, one of those briefings. Um, and I do want to just um, hit on something that you you said. This seems like an internal management, and it is an internal management regulation, and it codifies a lot of what, for example, OMB has in place. However, it's never been done by regulation. So what we're saying from this point forward that there will be a um, cause of action. People will actually be able to take us to court if we don't follow this regulation today. So this empowers the American people to demand future transparency from this agency going forward. So that was why we thought it was important to do it as a rulemaking instead of just as, a, for example, a, you know, a memo from myself to my to, to the staff on on how to conduct regulatory rulemaking. Uh, Myron, did I see you leaning forward trying to join the conversation there? Uh, yes, but I think I'll I think I'll defer and let let a couple of questions come in. Uh, I think there's some uh, I think a couple of very interesting issues have been raised here, but I, I think there are also some interesting questions on the board here. Very good. Uh, let's keep keep going and try to keep explaining what's happening here. Um, uh, Mr. Wheeler, I have a question from Annie Snyder with Politico, and she asks, uh, I see that the final rule cites good cause to begin implementing immediately. Are there any forthcoming rules you expect to this effect? And, and before you answer 
uh, Ms. Snyder's question, uh, could you also explain for the lay audience, what does the term good cause mean? Uh, well, first of all, let me address Annie's question because I think that would get to the good cause issue. Um, this is effective immediately upon publication in the Federal Register, and we expect it will be published tomorrow. Um, I signed this last Wednesday, and we've already been told it will be published in tomorrow's Federal, Federal Register. But I think the big question of what she's getting at is whether or not it applies to um, proposed rulemakings, and it does not. Um, if we if there's a proposed rulemaking, it does not. You don't. We don't have to go back as an agency and start over again. So um, going forward, it would only apply to the rulemakings that are just beginning with internally within the agency. Thank you. Very good. And that also takes care of our next question from uh, Cheryl Hogue at Chemical and Engineering News, who wanted to know about the effective date. So uh, we got effective a tomorrow. Um, I would also encourage uh, our audience to, if you have access to it, look at today's Wall Street Journal. You had a uh, essay published today, um, which leads me to the question, how, how much the, these rules uh, are a very big deal, right? They affect hundreds of millions of people at a time. Uh, how much time and energy do you put into and your staff put into explaining them once you've come to the decision about what to do? Uh, it seems like we almost have many campaigns around uh, the communication efforts. Is this something that you devote a lot of time to? Absolutely. Um, you know, and for this rulemaking in particular, we went out for public comment twice. We proposed this in 2018, and then we went out with a supplemental proposal earlier this year. We received more comments. I think overall between the two public comment periods, we probably had over a million comments. Um, so part of what we did in resp is respond to those comments in the final rulemaking, which is why it, it took time to put all this together. Um, we respond to all of the issues that were raised in the public comments, but we also, more importantly, listened to those public comments and made changes to the final regulation. As, as Myron mentioned earlier, you know, we've both broadened and narrowed at the same time. We listened to what people told us. We addressed the concerns that they had. There was concerns that the original proposal would have been retroactive. Um, we said at the time that it, it wouldn't be, um, but what we did in, with the final rulemaking tomorrow is, is specify in writing that this will not be retroactive. Um, so we, you know, we listened to the concerns that were raised, not just through the public comment period, but also concerns raised when I testified before Congress and, and meeting with groups around the country. Um, but as, as, as far as trying to explain this to the public, it, it is very difficult to break through at times um, with the media, particularly with when you have um, environmental activists masquerading as environmental reporters at a, a number of outlets um, where, where they have an agenda um, and the agenda is not to present the truth at times. Um, so, you know, it has been hard to break through to explain to the American public what we are doing. And I appreciate you all inviting us today to participate um, with you in this announcement. Um, I, I will say, I, you haven't, I don't know if you've gotten this question or not, but I certainly have gotten this question. Why do this with CEI? Um, and does this mean you know, that we agree with everything that CEI um, says and does? Um, you know, I, I look at CEI that you know, you're an organization that believes in, in transparency in government, and you all have championed that now for, for decades. Um, and you believe fundamentally in transparency. And that was why I thought it was very appropriate to do this event with you all today. It uh, doesn't mean that we agree on everything. In fact, you have sued me. Um, but I, in, in, in particular, and in, in on the ACE rule itself. And I'll, I'll never forget attending your annual dinner two years ago, I guess now, right after the ACE rule came out. And in your remarks, I was in the audience, you said that you're gonna hold back making any comments on the ACE rule because you wanted to read it first you may end up suing me. And you waited a few weeks and you read it over and then you did announce that you were suing us. Um, what I get aggravated with is some of the uh, organizations out there that announce and attorney generals in some of the states that they announce that they're suing us before they've even actually read the regulation. So I wanna applaud you for actually reading the regulations before you reach judgments and conclusions 
on whether or not you support something and whether or not you're going to litigate. I, I applaud you for doing that. I, um, and I wish everybody did. But you know, we don't always agree on everything. But I think here we do agree that transparency is important, that the American public needs more transparency in what the government does. Well, thank, could, thank I, you um, could I? Can't, could uh, I? Can we I, both want to talk on that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm can, can, can I, I add to that? I, I want to remind folks um, in those remarks. Um, uh, I did. I did tell the audience uh, the ACE rule overwhelmingly was a significant step forward. Yes. But we were going to pay attention to details, and that's why we took the time to go through every single provision to make sure that uh, uh, we thought they were in keeping with the rule of law and the actual authority provided by Congress. Uh, My Myron, why don't you go ahead? But I do have a, a series of other questions, but I've. Uh, inadvertently kept you out of the conversation here. Yeah, no, 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 you haven't. Uh, uh, Andrew, I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm glad you uh, you mentioned that we support uh, transparency. And of course, we filed a lot of FOIA requests against uh, EPA uh, over the years and, and have had to file lawsuits to try to uncover things. But um, I do want to just say, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, ha we're honored to host you, uh, even though we don't always agree. Uh, and uh, that is... Um, uh, I think uh, the sign of, uh, it seems to me, of adult debate is that we can disagree about things and still talk about them. And uh, what struck me about this rule in particular, but also a lot of the tenure of, of you and your predecessor, Scott Pruitt, during this administration, is that the, the media has used uh, certain scientific organizations and uh, environmental pressure groups to essentially uh, misinform the public about what you're doing. And you've mentioned that, but I just wanna underscore it. This is, uh, you know, the, the reports that have come out since uh, we announced our, our event yesterday in, in the mainstream media have been disgraceful. Uh, and uh, one of the things, you know, there was even this thing that it's all about defending the tobacco industry or something. I mean, this is, this is absurd as well as, as, as shameful. But I want to ask you about one of the issues that continually is raised by the uh, scientific, uh, some of the scientific pressure groups like the AAAS, and that is the use of studies that have uh, personal confidential information in them. Uh, and and uh, the Six City study is a good example of that. Uh, lots of epidemiological studies have personal information. So, the claim is that this rule uh, somehow threatens uh, the confidentiality of, of, of the study or the study can't be used because this data can't be made public. Uh, could you clarify what, how the rule will handle things that have uh, either PPI or CBI, personal information or business information? Sure, we, we affirmatively state that that data can still be, that those studies can still be used. Um, the PPI data does not need to be disclosed. Um, one of the things that we did in, in drafting this final rule is go to our science advisory board for specific advice on PPI. And they provided some great suggestions that we incorporated into the final regulation. But, you know, as I mentioned on the six city study, it, so, uh, it's not required. Could I, I just ask you to pause and repeat that sentence? I wanna make sure everybody gets it. Did I hear you correctly? Uh, PPI studies can be used and the information does not have to be disclosed. Absolutely. Okay, the I PPI just want data perfect does clarity not have that. to be disclosed to the public. The I'm sorry, studies I can still be used. Um, it needs, if the study cannot, if the underlying data cannot be available to the public, it can be made available um, through restricted access. Um, in addition to that, the underlying data can be made available, and oftentimes it is. You look at HHS, they oftentimes make underlying data um, using PPI information available by masking the individuals. So there are ways of making the data available, but even if that isn't done, you can still make the data available through restricted access. But at the end of the day, if there is an important study that involves PPI data and it can't be independently reviewed, they not, you can't grant restricted access but it's still important because it's needed as a pivotal study. The administrator of the agency can say this study can still be used for regulatory purposes. 
Um, there are so many you know, different ways that you can get that study in to the, um, to the regulatory process that you know, the claims that, that are being made by, um, again, by activists um, are, are just unfounded. And, and it shows that they have not read or they do not understand the regulation. Randy asks us, uh, how does this new rule interact with the IQA peer review guidelines? That's the Information Quality Act peer review guidelines. Oh, it works hand in hand with the peer review guidelines. Um, but again, it's important to remember that not all peer reviewed studies, the peer reviewers don't always, in fact, most times don't have access to the underlying data. Um, but we did follow um, the OMB, Office Management Budget um, peer review guidelines here um, in, in the drafting of this regulation. Um, but, it, but again, it's peer review doesn't always get to the question of is the information available to the public? And you know the peer review process has come under attack in recent years um, through a number of different scientific journals, um, and I know Myron has spoken to this in the in the past on on issues. Um, so it's important that as much data as as possible for the pivotal studies. And again, we when we make a regulatory decision, we look at hundreds of studies. But what we're doing here is saying of the hundreds of studies we look at, or even thousands in some cases, what are the pivotal studies that are the basis for our regulation? And then for those pivotal studies, we say, is that data available to the public? And if it's not, we then look at whether or not it's available through um, restricted access. And if it's not, um, then it's not weighted as high. You know, one of the, it was interesting that I, I read in one of the articles today, um, and I think this is quoting from Senator Carper's staff, a science, a, a science study from China this past spring, saying that that study may not be available for us to use. Well, quite frankly, with the misinformation coming out of China on a daily basis and the, you know, the whole problem we've had with coronavirus, I would hope that any future EPA administrator will look skeptically at any research coming out of China if the data is not available. Um, you know, that's, I, I just think, that goes to the heart of what frustrates so many people in this country when we base a regulation on a scientific study from China where the data is not available. How do we know that the data is actually accurate? Um, so you know, it, it's that was a, that was um, a red herring, I think, that was thrown out there by the Harper staff. But in any event, um, if that if that study were to be vital to the to regulatory mission of the agency, an EPA administrator could still allow that study to be considered. But I, I would hope that anybody would take take a skeptical look at any study coming from there, um, with all the inf misinformation we get on whether or not that data is available. No, there's, there's a topic here as I read through the materials, uh, which I encourage uh, the entire audience to do. This is this is not um, is very important. It's about scientific information, but it's not rocket science. You know, uh, I was able to get through the material, worked my way right through it uh, in one sitting. Uh, there is an issue there that that jumped out at me, kind of like a flashing light, and I can see the argument for it. And it also put a little bit of a, a shiver in my spine. I was hoping you could explain the parameters around administrator discretion. Uh, how does discretion work with the new rule? How can you as an administrator make decisions to not follow the rule or to exclude certain studies? And, and just, could you talk about that a bit? Sure, and I, and I thought this was important. Um, to, to include to, in the event that there is a pivotal study that is really fundamental to a regulation. Um, and that information is not available to the public, it's not available through restricted access. I, you know, if it's, it's, if it's really that fundamental and we have to use it, then there needs to be a process in place to allow the use of that study. Um, and so we, we put in the regulation that the administrator of the EPA, um, you know, we, we, this is a almost 14,000 person agency, but this rests with the administrator. Um, and we said this in the original proposal, but you know, I guess we didn't really explain it well enough in the proposal. So what we did for the final is lay out a number of steps that the administrator has to take a look at to, to and, it's, and it is laid out in the regulation on, on whether or not the pivotal study is important enough to be used if it doesn't meet the data access requirements. And that is laid out and the administrator would have to, in the regulation, 
um, specify that they are allowing the use of this study and explain why they're allowing the use of the study. So, um, you know, we tried to, you know, that this, this is, you know, this is um, difficult at times, some of these questions, um, but I wanted to make sure that if it was truly a pivotal study that needed to be used, that it could still be used, but require the use of it to be explained by the agency. So the administrator would have to explain in the rulemaking, in the preamble of the rule, why we were relying upon a study that the information was not publicly available. And I think that, you know, I think that um, I understand when you say that it's give you a shiver up your spine, but you also um, like part of it as well. You know, that is a difficult decision. Um, and I imagine it will be used sparingly in the future, but what will be different going forward is that the administrator would have to explain in the rulemaking that they allow the use of the pivotal science without the data being available. And so just that explanation, I think, should help give you and others comfort who want everything to be open to sunshine. And I agree that everything should be open to sunshine, but as administrator sitting here over the last um, two and a half years, and a number of briefings from the agency staff, um, there's been some studies that I, I would say were absolutely pivotal and we needed to use whether or not that information was available to the public. Now this wasn't, this rule wasn't in, a, in wasn't being applied over the last two and a half years. So I, I can't say whether or not those studies actually made their information available, but I can certainly look at some very important studies that were the underpinnings of a number of our regulations and say those studies absolutely needed to be used for this regulation. And I'm not saying whether or not that data was available. I don't know, I haven't gone back to look, but um, certainly an administrator of the agency, the mission of this agency is to protect public health and the environment. And at the end of the day, anybody sitting in this chair as the administrator of the EPA needs to make the best decisions protecting public health and the environment. That's the mission of our agency. And, um, and, and that has to be the guiding principle for, that's been the guiding principle for every decision I've made. And that has to be the guiding principle going forward. Uh, one thing that's come up uh, over the years with our uh, review of the operations of the agency, and I, I think it might have some bearing here with the, the new rule about transparency, is not only the work that the EPA does that relies on outside comments and outside scientific uh, knowledge that is developed, but the work that the EPA does to generate that. So you spend a lot of money, you issue grants to study things, to develop new information. Uh, would the next incremental step going forward on transparency take some version of this and apply it to the grant making process? Well, it's it's already there. When we when we issue grants, we we expect that the information be made available to the public. So we are doing that, and that should be in place going forward. Um, you know, the, the the one thing that I, that I said the next phase for this for the science transparency, and that I outlined in a speech. Um, I believe that was at the Nixon Library. Um, it was pretty sometime this fall. Was that you know we were this is the framework rule, the science transparency framework rule for the entire agency. And then going forward, what I propose that we do, and I still believe is necessary, is to have a, a separate science transparency regulation for each of our major statutes. Um, and and my plan was to uh, you know after this rulemaking is finished, and I believe the well the Clean Air Office took the first lead on the cost benefit regulation, for example, and they were scheduled to take the first lead on the science transparency regulation. And I believe there's already been some preliminary staff work done in the Air Office to start that process. But my goal was after we complete the science transparency rulemaking um, for the overall framework that we then approach each statute on a statute by statute basis and further define how we're going to use science transparency in each of our regulations under each of our statutes. And I still think that's important and it's important for the agency to accomplish at some point in the future. Myron, let me ask you, uh, the Administrator Wheeler made mention earlier of uh, the methods used at the Health and Human Services to protect personal information and how those methods can be adopted across government and, and implemented here. Are there things that other agencies that rely on scientific information can learn from what the EPA has done here? I'm thinking specifically uh, organizations like at the Department of Commerce and NOAA and some of these other 
scientifically driven organizations that too often look like a black box for those of us trying to understand where they come up with policy recommendations. Uh, thanks, Kent. Uh, look, I think that there's um, at, at scientific agencies that don't have any regulatory uh, powers, a lot of the science done at NOAA doesn't lead NOAA to regulate things or NASA. EPA is a regulatory agency par excellence. So what the problem that, that we have with secret science at, at agency climate science, for example, at NOAA and NASA is that we're, we're expected to believe, you know, it's trust us, we're scientists, scientists. And that's, in, that's career scientists at the agency and it's also outside science, you know, trust us, we're scientists. At EPA, the problem it's not only that, it's trust us, we're regulators. Um, and uh, you can't trust either end unless you have transparency. And that's why this rule is important. And I think it does have an application at some of the other regulatory agencies. And I think actually interior, uh, you know, we had a discussion with Secretary Bernhardt, Dave Bernhardt uh, last month. Uh, and we talked about the EPA rule uh, rules that they've gotten through to reform the implementation of the Endangered Species Act. And I think they've done some similar things there. Andrew may know about that, but I think there's there's a sort of common theme here that we need more transparency and less trust us, we're scientists, trust us, we're regulators. But I, I do want to underscore one thing that Andrew said uh, previously, which is very important. Uh, a lot of people on our side are, are concerned that this rule just doesn't do enough. It still has too many too much discretion for the for the administrator to overrule what's in the regulation. I think that that is a, a slight misunderstanding of the rule and I think Andrew clarified it and I think people should read the rule uh, and I think it, it's available today or tomorrow in, in preprint online the Federal Register. But the key is that right now the, the administrator and, and his designees in the agency have complete discretion to do anything they want with the, the way they use science and they're not really accountable. This rule says that the, the administrator still has that discretion. We, we, we recognize that the way the agency is set up, the administrator has a lot of discretion to do things. But now when he does something involving a, a scientific issue used in regulation, he has to explain why this particular secret science study that we're not actually uh, satisfied with the way it, 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 it's not, it's not transparent. We're still going to use it, but I'm going to now have to explain why I'm using it. And he also said earlier, and I think this is very important, this rule gives outside parties uh, the ability to, to uh, 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 file lawsuits eventually. And that applies not only to groups on our side, it applies to environmental pressure groups, and to scientific groups, so and and state AGs on both sides, Republicans and Democrats. So I think that this this rule is a big step forward in putting the administrator, making him accountable for essentially discretionary decisions. And I, you know, Andrew, is that is that a fair summary of of of, of, of a couple key points? A absolutely. And I just want to reiterate for the for other critics of, of this rulemaking that in in this rulemaking. None of the discretion of the EPA administrator goes away. I, I, the EPA administrator still has the same discretion that the administrator has always had and will always have. It's just that we have to explain, the administrator will have to explain um, why they are using a study that's the information is not available to the public. So it's again, it's, it's, it's sunshine, it's, it's transparency. Um, and you're absolutely right. I, I, th I think people um, may, may litigate some of this. I hope not. I, I hope when we make the, the information available for, for why we're making our decisions and identifying the studies that we're using, because um, my goal is, and through this and our cost benefit rule is actually to reduce litigation and to reduce misunderstanding of our regulatory decisions. Because um, I, I really do fundamentally believe if we explain to the American public we do a better job of explaining to the American public what we are doing. There will be a more acceptance in our regulatory decisions. Because in the past, and you know, I go back to I know I, in the 90s, I, I cut my teeth um, criticizing some of the decisions by, of the agency at the time on the ozone and the PMNX and which studies were being used. And there were several 
um, several congressional hearings with the and Administrator Browner trying to explain to the committees on both the House and the Senate which studies she used and which studies she didn't use in making her decision. The agency had upfront stated which were the pivotal studies that they used and made the information, the data available in those studies. I think a lot of that controversy in the 90s would have gone away. Let, let me ask, uh, we're, we're starting to run short on time. Uh, I have another question that takes us deep into the weeds from uh, Maria Hegstead of Inside EPA, and I want to read that to you uh, before we get to any wrap up. Um, uh, but I do have at least one, one or two other questions for you. Uh, but first, from uh, Maria at Inside EPA, uh, could the administrator address how the agency will affect the TOSCA program? OPPT has struggled with very limited number of studies regarding some of those first 10 evaluations of existing chemicals already, as well as CBI issues, which, which we've discussed, and releasing studies publicly for several others. How will the EPA ensure this rule doesn't exacerbate those issues going forward? Uh, and the, these issues and studies with very small numbers. Sure, I, I, don't, I don't think it would exacerbate the, the, that problem at all. Um, in fact, it should help clear up some of the questions around our decisions under the new TOSCA, um, as far as which studies we're using and which ones we consider pivotal. You know, again, if there's only five or six studies for for any for a chemical under the TOSCA program, um, I, I would imagine that all those studies would need to be considered pivotal. Um, and, and but hopefully that data is available. And I, you know, there's the, the TOSCA program. We just finished the the ninth of our of our first ten. Um, risk assessments, um, and we're already getting a lot of questions from interest groups on both sides about how we're making these decisions. And I think having that information out there um, publicly is, is going to be um, very key to, to, to the implementation of the TOSCA rule. So I, I don't see this hampering TOSCA at all. In fact, I think it will help enhance the decision making um, that we're using. And it's, you know, it's, it's my understanding a lot of the studies we have used under the TOSCA program for these for these chemicals, the data has been available. Um, but going forward, we want to make sure that we identify those studies that are pivotal, and make sure that that data has is available. And if not, the administrator again can exempt that study um, and say that we we have to use this study regardless of the availability of the data. Um, so that's that's not going to be a I don't think that's going to be a problem or an issue at all under TOSCA. Myron, before I ask the administrator for uh, one last question and for his closing comments, do you have any wrap up observations you'd like to make? Uh, well, yes. Uh, Andrew, I think uh, there's there have been a couple questions that uh, that haven't been addressed here that I think uh, Bill uh, summarized some of them. Um, let me just ask that and say uh, this is of concern to everyone. Uh, uh, who looks at the regulatory state and what yeah. you've done to deregulate and what you've done to bring, uh, you know, sound procedures and sound science into the regulatory process. Um, uh, Bill asks, how much of the progress made by Administrator Wheeler on this and other issues can be undone by the incoming administration? Um, and, uh, you know, I... Uh, Darren asks a, a, a similar question about, would you agree that by getting public comments and more outside expertise on the pivotal science being used, the EPA will promulgate more sound regulations? Well, of course, I think we could say, yes, that's a softball question, but uh, I think it does get to the, the point of this process uh, is going to help going forward in future administrations, whether they're really uh, antithetical or, or opposed or, or trying to try to 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 get their regulation through despite what the science may say it's going to help limit what they can do is that is that a correct kind of uh, summation of, of, of why this rule is important despite the fact that the people coming in may not like it and may want to ignore it I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you that this will help limit what they can do I, I, I and maybe I'm taking you out of context on, on that comment. Um, you, you know, this, this rule, we, we had a lot of career employees across all of our offices. Um, Office of Research and Development took the lead in the writing of this rulemaking. 
This is supported, this rulemaking is supported by the career employees across the agency. Um, we work with attorneys um, in our general counsel's office, as well as attorneys at the Department of Justice on the, the, the legal underpinnings of this rule. And I believe, and a lot of, a lot of our staff believe that this is going to help make our regulatory decisions more legally sound um, by, by publicizing and explaining um, the science that we're using. And it's going to um, hopefully you know, decrease the, the amount of, um, of litigation on the scientific questions and, and um, hopefully maybe get um, judges out of the habit of making scientific determinations for the agency. If we explain what the science is that we use for regulation, that's gonna help, I, be, I believe, explain to the court the rationale um, behind our decisions. I, you know, I look back at, um, you know, I, I look back at the, the pesticide this summer um, um, in, you know, dicamba, thank you. I'm getting whispered from, from the side of the room. Thank you, dicamba decision with the, with the, the, the uh, Ninth Circuit out in California when they, when they um, went ahead and, and banned the use of dicamba and they, in their opinion, um, made a lot of st statements about what they thought we said and what we thought the agency believed on the science. You, you know, I think if the original dicamba um, registration had been you know, more clear, and I think our um, regulation this summer um, for dicamba, where we, we put more specificity in the science we were using to make our determination on dicamba. If we had done that up front originally on the original dicamba registration, I think we could have avoided the entire Ninth Circuit Court um, decision and, and case. Um, so I, I think whenever the agency explains its science in a better fashion, you're going to have better regulatory decisions and you're going to have a better process when it gets to, when it gets to litigation. And I think we learned our lesson on dicamba the first time around and we implemented it in the dicamba decision this summer. Um, so I, no, I, I think it's, um, and Myron, I'm sorry, I think you had two questions and I answered the second one. I don't remember the first one now. Well, that, that suggests that you're practicing these okay. things. That's okay. I think I think you I think you answered it uh, uh, adequately, and and we're uh, I think Kent wants you to sum up now, and we'll say thank you and end this event on time. I, I do have one final question for you, and maybe you can include it as uh, your summary, your forward-looking uh, uh, discussion. Um, and like Myron, I want to thank you for what you've been doing here with the staff to make this information going forward, more available for review. It helps the public understand what the decisions are, how they've been arrived at, and uh, what we can expect going forward. Uh, but I'd like you to step for a moment just out of the habit uh, that you have, a very good habit, of trying to follow the law and administer the agency according to the dictates of the law as it is, and ask you to speak for a moment directly to thousands of people who work on Capitol Hill. Uh, we're being covered today by C-SPAN. You know as well as I that it's piped into every single office and it is the channel of choice for lawmakers. What would you have Congress change that would help the EPA do better work? So you have a, a open pipeline. You're not only speaking directly to dozens of reporters at this moment, but to lawmakers and their staff. What should the next Congress do to strengthen the EPA clarify how you operate and make these sorts of scientific decisions better? Well, yeah, Kent, um, you know, I, I appreciate you pointing out that I follow the law and I do. I also follow the, uh, the administrative, the administration's requirements and that is not to um, advocate to Congress on changes in any laws without going through OMB and the White House first. I, so I, I sense to, a dodge very careful here. there. Um, you know, and as I, you know, I, I started my career at EPA, but then I went and worked in, in the Senate for 14 years, and I was the staff director for the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, um, the most powerful and important committee on Capitol Hill. Um, and, you know, I, I guess if I, the message to the members of, of Congress, um, you know, I and I and I and I wrote about this in an op-ed recently in a in a, in a newspaper, um, where I think that over the years Congress has, has ceded too much authority to regulatory agencies, 
you know, on the one hand, they, they, um, they tie our hands in some cases uh, with, uh, with processes, but then they, on the other hand, that they, they see too much authority to, to agencies. And I, and I think part of what I've tried to do and part of what this administration under President Trump's leadership, what we've tried to do is open up the government to more transparency. And that's been fundamental to everything that we've done, particularly a number of reforms we've done here at the, at, at the agency. You know, President Trump issued an executive order last year requiring that all guidance documents be made available to the public on a searchable database. And EPA was the first agency to comply with that executive order earlier this year. We had over, we didn't even know how many guidance documents we had. We had over 10,000 guidance documents. I think we actually had over 12,000. We ended up rescinding a thousand guidance documents that were unnecessary, but people still had to follow them because they were they were basically you know requirements of the agency. So we rescinded over a thousand guidance documents, and we published um, over ten thousand guidance documents, which is an awful lot for one regulatory agency. But all those are now on a searchable database for the public to see. So you know, it, I don't think we get enough credit as an administration. I don't think President Trump gets enough credit for wanting to open up government processes to sunlight, to scrutiny, to, um, to the public. Because, you know, he fundamentally believes that the public has a right to know what the government is doing. Uh, and that's, he's been fighting for that for years. I've been fighting for that for years as well. Um, and as EPA administrator, you know, for, between our cost benefit regulation, which requires the agency to be upfront with the costs and the benefits of all of our clean air regulations going forward to our, to our, um, to the permitting reforms that we've put in place, where we've gotten our permitting down, down to under six months in most cases, to um, the guidance documents being made available in a public um, database, um, to today's decision on science transparency, where we are explaining to the American public for the first time, what are the science studies that we are using for our regulatory decisions and um, the data for those studies um, to be sure that they are available to the public. And I want to, again, thank you for hosting. Ken, thank you so much, Myron. Great to see you again. I really appreciate CEI hosting this event today. Uh, I want to I reflect that back to you. I appreciate the work that you've been doing, the willingness to explain your work and show your work. Uh, please stay healthy. I want to ask our audience, just for 90 seconds of your time, as we wrap up, you will automatically be directed to a short survey. It'll take less than two minutes of your time. It helps us shape the programming going forward. Uh, as you know, over the past many months, we've had um, really some standout folks participate. And that is in part due to your information, your feedback. So uh, whether it's Chairman Ajit Pai from the FCC, Commissioner Pierce from the SEC, Senator Lee, uh, all of these folks and the issues that they have addressed uh, in part are informed by the information that we receive from you. Um, going forward, I want you to stay tuned not only to our webpage where you can find all of these past uh, programs, but to your email so you, you'll have information about upcoming programs and that topic that Administrator Wheeler just closed with, the October 2019 executive order on dark matter and the subsequent uh, databases that are created by regulatory agency. All of that has been documented, how it's been rolled out, the successes and the failures by our own Wayne Cruz. So please look for that information on our website as well. Uh, Andy, Myron, thank you both very much. With that, we will close.